Please join me in welcoming Saul Khan. No, it's, it's, I mean, th th out of all of the talks I've done over the past year, th I, it's a complete honor to be here because I'm, I'm around real teachers. So, <laughs> so, 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 so just, to, just to start off, I, how many of you all have been to the site or somewhat familiar? Oh, cool. Oh, maybe the other way. How many of you are not familiar so I know who to talk to? Okay, very good. Very good. All right, so what I'll, what I'll do is I'll start, I'll, I'll show a little montage of some of the videos, because that's kind of how Khan Academy started, but what we'll talk about over the next few minutes, and then later I think today we have a Q&A session we're doing in another room. Um, I, I, I want to talk to you what, what we're up to, which is actually the videos are a very small part of it. They kind of complement the, the, the bigger picture. So let me just show you this, this, this collection of videos, just so you know what, how it started. You can integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity over interstellar, or almost you could call it intergalactic. So the right slot is I plus one. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. Notice this is an aldehyde. And it's an alcohol. It's some type of an infectious disease. Exactly. So the key is when you start to look at data, you have to look at all aspects of it. Ours is their 30 million plus the 20 million dollars from the American manufacturer. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. One of the few audiences that truly appreciates Euler's identity. I, that's very good. Very good. So just to give you a snapshot of where we are now, and it was covered a little bit in, in, in the introduction, and it, you know, all of this is kind of, these are surreal, not, actually everything here is, is surreal for me because it's been kind of a wild ride over the last few years. Uh, but we're, we're pushing, we're actually over 5 million unique users now, and yet as, as we're true that 60 minutes, it, there's reason to believe we're now sticking at 7 or 8 million. It, it's kind of crazy what happened after that. Uh, but we just had our 400 millionth exercise done, and I'll tell you what these exercises are all about. Um, and, and so it's kind of crazy numbers. And you know, that last point, they're not to pick on Harvard. Obviously, Harvard is doing something very different than what we're doing. You get to go there and you know l l see the the manicured lawns and all the rest. But but the um, but but the uh, but but it gives you a sense for scale. And I mean, this is kind of. We do this just to remind ourselves kind of the responsibility that's kind of fallen our, in our lap, but the number of students who are using us on a monthly basis right now is equal to eight times the number of students who've ever attended Harvard since 1636. So it's a large number. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think a lot of y'all probably know a little bit of the backstory. It started literally in 2004. Uh, I, I was, I was a, a newly minted MBA. I was working at an investment firm in Boston. I had just gotten married. And I had a cousin visit me, or actually the, her whole family was visiting me after my wedding in Boston. Uh, her name was Nadia, a super smart girl. You know, I was telling her, hey, you know, you should, you should you know, tour the universities here, MIT, Harvard, you know, become a CS major, then eventually parlay that into a, field, into a finance job. And we could, uh, and, and, and um, when, when I was, her mom said, well, you know, this is very nice. You're like an older brother figure to Nadia, but she's actually having trouble with math. And, you know, I, I told Nadia, I said, well, you know, that's hard to believe. This girl is so bright. She's really engaging to talk to. Uh, we, we share a certain amount of DNA. Uh, th this is... <laughs> and, and so I asked Nadia, and she said she was having trouble with units. She was entering seventh grade. She took a placement exam, units. She couldn't convert kilometers, meters, ounces, gallons. And so I, I, I said, well, I have trouble believing that this is beyond you. When you go back to New Orleans, which is where I grew up, how about we figure some way to tutor each other? We work with each other. My after work for me, after school for you. And, and, and she was game. I think she was skeptical, but, but she was eager that, that I was willing to spend some time with her. And so she went back. And, and you know, long story short, the first month was difficult. Frankly, she was just disengaged. She wasn't even thinking about it. She'd just given up. Uh, but then after another month of a fairly intense, every day, half an hour, uh, it started to pay off. And then at that point, when I started to see that she was really accelerating, I, I became something of a, a, a tiger cousin. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I called up her school and I said, you know, I, I think Nadia needs to retake that placement exam. And they said, who, who are you? <laughs> I, I'm her cousin. What's, what's this? But it, 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 we, it worked out and, and, and she ended up doing very well. Actually, we had dinner with her last night. She's a, a sophomore at Sarah Lawrence now. Uh, and uh, so, so 
After that, her brothers were interested, started tutoring them, uh, started, uh, word got around in the family. Um, and so you, you fast forward uh, to 2006, and by this time we had moved out to uh, Silicon Valley, to the Bay Area, and um, I was after work tutoring about 15 to 20 cousins and family members around the country. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember, you know, I, I had dinner with a, a friend of mine in, in Silicon Valley, and, and, I, and I was kind of showing off about this thing. You know, I had this day job, but frankly, this was where a lot of my energy was going. And I was like, look, you know, I got all these cousins I'm tutoring. I'd even started on writing a little bit of a software platform so I could give them basic, basic kind of, make sure that they had a solid grounding and some basic concepts so that when we actually interacted with each other, I had better information. And, and what I was telling him is, that it was really great with Nadia. We were really able to connect on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But now, even when I was teaching you know, 15 students, I was trying to do it at four or five at a time. Even that was difficult. We weren't able to have real meaningful conversations. We weren't able to connect at the same level. Sometimes I felt like I was being repetitive. Sometimes I felt, you know, I wish they were here a week before when I had already covered that or, or whatever else. And, and he said, well, you know, why don't you make some little videos and, and put them up on YouTube and maybe that can kind of offload some of what you do and you could be more interactive when you, when you talk to your cousins, have more of a discussion with them. And, you know, I, I was immediately dismissive. I said, no, 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 you know, YouTube is for cats playing piano, not, <laughs> not for s serious mathematics. Um, but uh, I, I went home that weekend and uh, I got over the idea that it was not my idea, uh, which is, which is, <laughs> Which is difficult for an MBA, and I um, and I uh, I gave it a shot, and and you know I, and it was very simple. I mean you saw I, I mean what you saw is actually the the fancier videos. The old ones it was it looked like chicken scratch on you know I had I had very I had like twenty dollars worth of equipment that I was using to make them. But, but I, I asked my cousins, you know, what do you think? I said, hey, why don't you watch these videos on, on your own time, you know, uh, fill up, fill any gaps you might have, and then when we get together, why don't we have questions or why don't we have a conversation instead of me kind of explaining something to you? And so, and, and tell me what you think. And their very first feedback, you know, it was, it was somewhat backhanded. They said that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> that was, and I full, fully haven't clarified, you know, whether that's an overarching statement. But, it, but, but when you view it from their point of view, it made a lot of sense. And, and I, I also want to clarify what they were saying, what I think they were saying, and I have clarified this a little bit with them. When the first time that they were engaging with something or getting an explanation or trying to understand something, it was stressful to have their cousin around, me looking over their shoulder, or I guess virtually looking over their shoulder and saying, do you get this? Or they didn't want to waste my time. They might have been embarrassed that they had a gap from fourth grade material or fifth grade material or whatever else. Now they could engage in it, they could engage with it when they were ready for it. Some days I was tired, some days they were tired. They can do it when, when they had time for it. But they still appreciated the live interactions. We continued to do the live interactions, but what it changed to the live interactions is that it made them more interactive. It made them more conversational. It made them much more like what I was doing with Nadia from the get-go. So what, really what it was is they appreciated having the virtual cousin for the explanations, but they really appreciated having the live cousin for the true interactivity, for the real human connection. But then, like a lot of stories, you know, I think on, on YouTube, how these things happen, it, it was there out there in the public, and people just started saying, thank you. Uh, this helped. This, you know, this kind of filled in some gaps that I needed for an algebra exam. I got letters from some, you know, people closer to my age who are saying, I'm just retiring from the military. I want to go back to college, and I haven't seen math in 15 years, and I didn't like it even 15 years ago. And, and, and this is what bridged the gap, and now I could go back to the community college. And so you know, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty in, intense stuff. You know, eventually, I started getting letters from, you know, uh, I, one, uh, we've gotten several along this narrative now, but I remember that first letter from a parent of a child that had a attention deficit disorder and, and he said it was ADHD or it was, it was some type of learning disability and said you know this, this is the only thing that my son connects with because he can pause, he can repeat it, the contrast of the colors and, and said you know my, me and my family are, we pray for you and your family every night and, 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 and you have to remember I, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. This is, <laughs> this is, I, all, perhaps my investors might have been praying but other than that it was, uh, it was, uh, so, so you fast forward now to 2009, the site traffic kept growing, growing, growing. I got more and more interested in, in fact, even during the financial crisis, uh, you know, no one knew what was going on in, in the investment world. We just kind of parked the whole money in, in, in cash and, and I started reading the Federal Reserve Act and I started making a bunch of videos on, on the financial crisis. And, and, and I actually got an, an email from, uh, 
of a banker, I won't say which bank, and he says, you know, thank you so much for this. Uh, I've been working in mortgage-backed securities for the past five years, and now I understand what they are, which is, <laughs> which is a, which, a bit better late than ever, I guess. That's a, that's a, uh, but, but, um, you know, so, so 2009, I frankly had trouble focusing on my day dot job. We had set it up as a, as a 501c3 not-for-profit by that point. And, uh, and essentially, you know, not, I did not really know what it meant to start a not-for-profit, but I just got the sense we had already at that point become kind of the most used video learning platform on the internet, and I, I got a sense that there's an infinite social return on investment here, that this stuff is timeless, that this could continue to teach forever. Uh, and, 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 and so I, I quit my job, you know, with the point of view that, hey, we have about a year's worth of savings, see what happens. And I think like a lot of entrepreneurial stories, uh, not, not much happened for the next nine months. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, but then in May of 2010, I got a, uh, I had a little PayPal donation on, on, on the site, which is still there if you're interested. And, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of $5, $10, even a $50 donation every now and then. It was amounting to a couple hundred dollars a month. And all of a sudden, a $10,000 donation came in. And so I immediately, you know, I look at it. Her name was Ann Doer. Uh, she was actually local in Palo Alto. I immediately emailed her. I was like, you know, thank you very much. Uh, this is the largest donation Khan Academy's ever received. If, if we were a physical school, you would now have a building named after you, which is, <laughs> Which I, have now, which I have now learned is actually very, cost, very cheap. I've talked to the folks at Stanford. $10,000 buys you, like, not even a bench. But the, the um, so Anne, Anne, Anne said, uh, well, we should meet. And so we met at an Indian buffet in downtown Palo Alto. And she said, well, well where do you hope to take all of this? And I said, well, I want to keep doing this. We could translate it. We can bring other people on board. And we can build this whole software platform. And at this point, I was thinking this is primarily something that kind of happens in the non-formal education. It's kind of a supplement for people who have a formal education and for people who have nothing else, like the kid who retires from the military. This is a bridge where they, where they have access to nothing else. And I kind of threw out, and I think there's a potential just based on what I felt with my cousins. And we'd run a couple of summer camps. There's a potential to supercharge what happens in the classroom, to kind of offload some of the traditional lectures so that classroom time could be more interactive. And so, you know, she kind of nodded and she said, well, this is all, you know, this sounds very good. How are you supporting yourself? And, you know, I said, I'm, I'm not. This is, this is. <laughs> and so she kind of nodded. We left. I'm driving home. Right as I get into my driveway, I get a text message from Ann, which now I, I really look forward to her, her messages. And, 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 her, and, and it said, you need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. Which is, you know, so, so, so it was a good day. It was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, um, and um, so, so I, you know, I, I, and, and you know, and, and no, I was actually starting to update my resume at that point, and, and, you know, fully cognizant that people in my old job would question my character for starting a not-for-profit, and so I, uh, so, <laughs> and, and, and so I, um, uh, I, I, no, they're actually very nice. They're, it's easy to make fun of them, but no, no, they're actually very surprised. So, so fast forward, now a whole bunch of crazy things started to happen. Uh, July of 2010, I was running a little summer camp. I, you know, I was this kind of virtual personality on, on YouTube, but I, I was, I kind of had a hunger to do what you guys do. And, and, and so I said, oh, I want to run this little summer camp to see what we could do in a, in a physical environment. And so I was running this little simulation where six students were playing a game of risk. And then 20 other students who are trading securities based on the outcome of the game of risk, and, uh, which is a good game. You just learn about probability. And, it's a, it's a, and, uh, and I got another text message from Ann. And this one, frankly, even, even weirder or more exciting. It was, I'm at the Aspen Institute you know, Ideas Festival, main pavilion. Bill Gates is on stage right now talking about you for the past five minutes talking about how he uses Khan Academy, uses it for his children. And my original thought was, you know, those videos were for Nadia, not, 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 not Bill Gates. This is, uh, I might have to redo some of these. Um. And, and so you can imagine, the first thing I did, I booted the closest seventh grader off of a computer to see if this was actually happening. I, started, I looked on, I was like, no, it's, it's, it was happening somewhere out there in reality. And so you, you can imagine when I went home that evening, I had this kind of very uh, uh, strange, Thing going. I mean, I, I was still operating literally out of a closet, and but this thing had apparently occurred, and I was saying, you know, what do I do now? Do, do I call Bill? Do, do I? I suspect he's not listed. I, I don't know what the uh, protocol here is, and uh, 
So, so it was like that for like two weeks. I didn't know what to do. And then t I, I eventually got a call, uh, phone rang. Uh, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. I was like, oh, nice, nice to meet you. And um, uh, you might have heard, Bill's a fan. I was like, yeah, I heard that. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and he would love to meet you and figure out how you could support if you have time to fly up to Seattle. And, and I, I was looking at my calendar at the moment uh, for the month, for the, uh, completely blank. Completely, <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I uh, I said, yeah, you know, I got to cut my nails on Wednesday, but maybe, <laughs> maybe after that I could go fly and meet Bill Gates. I could, uh... so, so long story short, he, he ended up supporting us. And actually at the same amount of time, and all this crazy stuff happened, Google actually also decided to support Khan Academy in a major way. They had this 10 to the 100th project for ideas that could change the world. I now say there are two major institutions in Mountain View, Google and the Khan Academy. And, uh, <laughs> good, it's, it's a... And so we, we, were, we, we were up and running. And so what we started, what we started building, and, and this is actually kind of a derivative of, of what, what I started with from my cousins, but it's, it's essentially this, this software platform. It's not just videos, and some of the Google funding is to translate into actually now 12 languages of the world, literally the top 12 languages, and, and uh, Bengali, Spanish, and Portuguese are already well underway. We're gonna surface the Spanish content very shortly, and actually that has consequences, we think, even in, in the US. But this is where the bulk of the resources are going, is, the, is this kind of virtual learning platform. And the, the idea is each of those nodes there are, are a concept. And, and the, the videos you saw are much broader. The exercises are much more, are, are narrower. Uh, right now they're just math, but we want to expand this, and so we could talk more about it in the other session. And, but the general idea is once you master one concept, then you, then you move down that chain to more and more advanced concepts. This is what one of them looks like. This is kind of a more conceptual one to understand what a derivative really is. You know, it's not just memorize the power rule. It's literally, it's the slope of the tangent line. It's the instantaneous rate of change. And so the student changes the slope of the tangent line at every one of those points. And so they end up essentially plotting the derivative and hopefully getting a little bit of an intuition for what a derivative is. And there's video, the video's there to complement it in, a, in any way, shape, or form. And, 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 and while we were, you know, while we were doing this, the Los Altos School District, which is local, said, hey, we would like to do a pilot with you guys. What, how would you, what's the ideal way to, to use you guys as a tool? And we said, well, we think students can learn the core material at, at their own pace now. We get a lot of data, we track everything, and, and the videos are there as kind of these on-demand lectures. We think we can make the classroom more interactive, more self-paced, more engaging for everyone involved if the teacher instead of giving lectures and spending a lot of time grading homework and things like that, is spending most of their time doing one-on-one -on -one interventions, small groups, leading projects, doing deeper learning, explorations of the material even before you actually get to the content so that kids have kind of a visceral understanding of it. And somewhat surprising, because we were like a three-person organization, they said, sure, let's try it. And, uh, and, and so what happened was, so I'll show you a couple of these modules. This is basic subtraction. So they're not all, you know, we're trying to make them as, as conceptual as possible. But Los Alamos, this is essentially one of the dashboards that the teacher saw in the fifth grade classroom. Every column here is one of those concepts that you saw in that knowledge map. Every row is a student in the class, and it literally updates in real time. And green means that the student is already, by our metrics, seems to be proficient in that concept. Blue means they're working on it, but no need to worry. And red means it seems like they're stuck. They've watched a video. They've done everything else. They've watched hints. So some type of intervention. You know, what we have hasn't been enough for that student. They need something. And so what's been happening, it's been emerged organically. And all of this has been working with the teachers in Los Altos now on a district-wide basis, is they, and, and different teachers do it a little bit different. That's what's been interesting to us, to see how it's applicable in different contexts. They essentially will either get one of the other students who've mastered that concept to be the first line of intervention to see if they can tutor their peers. And also while they do that, they're gonna be learning it a lot deeper when they have to explain it. Or they will go and do a small group intervention, the teacher themselves, or maybe with a, a TA who happens to be a fifth grader. Um, they, they'll, they'll sit down uh, next to, and, and no, I say that somewhat jokingly, but one of the classes, Richard Julian's fifth grade class, he had five students who had, he'd kind of deputized, they had earned it as they had kind of stepped into the role as teaching assistants and fifth graders. And, and I, I mean, it was amazing to observe it because he would, he would spend time with them, teaching them about empathy, how to explain things, just not to prove that you know it, but how, you know, and how to not make your uh, fellow student feel intimidated and things like that. And it was pretty amazing to see fifth graders actually step up to that, to that type of a role. And, and one thing I, you know, I, I really try to emphasize here is 
this is, you know, it's, it's a lot, in a lot of ways it's complete common sense. It's kind of what we see in the video game world. It's what would happen in karate class or music class. You learn a more basic thing and then you move on to the next thing. But it's not what, it's not the system, and it really is a system thing. It's not a people thing. It's not the system that we've all grown up in. We've all been indoctrinated and we all still kind of work in. And right now what happens is we have a fixed amount of time to, to teach something or learn something, and then we have an exam as a snapshot, and, and that exam, the variable is how well you learn it and then you move on, to the move on to the next concept. And you know, the analogy there is imagine if I was building a house and I build a foundation and I get the inspector and you know, how's the foundation? And he says, oh, it's 80% sound. It's like, that's a C, great. Let me build the first floor, 80% sound. That's a C, great, it passes, let me build the second floor. And then you keep building, keep building by the eighth floor, which uh, and maybe the eighth floor is where you're gonna put a little bit more weight now all of a sudden. The whole thing collapses and then you blame the eighth floor contractor for that. And uh, you see the analogy between the eighth floor. Eight. <laughs> but, 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 that's exactly what's, but, but that's exactly what's happening. You, 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 the students are essentially just being passed in these kind of fact, assembly line cohorts, you know, the Prussian model, year after year with recognized gaps. You, the assessment is telling you that they don't understand 20, 30, 40% of the material, but the model's like, oh, well, they're older, they have to go in, and then you keep pushing them ahead while they build this, and then when they don't understand algebra, and we've seen this actually in the data, some of the classes using, doing this for algebra, we're like, some of these kids don't understand decimals. You can't push them ahead until they build that foundation. And we're seeing it over and over again. That's it. And baby seals are cute. <laughs> So, so we wanted to arm the teachers, and we wanted to be as powerful of a tool as possible, so we wanted to give them as much data as possible so that they could intervene in, in kind of in a, in, a, in a knowledgeable way. So these are just some of the reports. It's all free, it's all online. You could do it formally in your classrooms. You could do it with your cousins and become a tiger cousin, I guess. Uh, this tells what the student's been working on, and we can dive deeper into the later session. This tells what the, what the student's been focused on, videos, exercises, you even know what the, you know, exactly when they did things, how long it took them. This is a problem by problem breakdown. Height is how long each of those problems took. Red is wrong, blue is right. You can actually click on each of those bars and see the exact problem, see the narrative, what choices they picked wrong first. If it was a multiple choice, some of these are free answers, some of them are, are more manipulative. This chart is another dashboard to kind of show the progress of all the students in aggregate in a class. Each line is a student. Horizontal axis is days on the site. Vertical axis is is oh, just a raw count of the number of modules completed. But what's powerful about this, we're seeing it in every class that we've worked with, whether it's a, a fluent a school, whether it's a, a charter school, an underserved area, whether it's a private school, it, it doesn't matter. When you start, there's a group of kids that race ahead and there's a group of kids that are falling behind. And a traditional model, you say, these are the gifted kids, you know, they're, they're gonna race ahead, take calculus and all the rest. These are the not so gifted kids. They're gonna, you know, essentially they're gonna go to trade school. We're lucky if they can end up going to, going to college. And what we're seeing over and over again, if you let those students build those foundations, fill in all the gaps that they have, even in basic multiplication or decimals or whatever else, that same student that you thought, and that blue student's one of them, that you thought was below average or one of the slow students two months ago, ends up being the second best student in the class. And over and over and over again, we're seeing this, this, this narrative. And it's funny because sometimes when I speak to, I spoke to an audience yesterday where it, it was frankly a crowd of people who are used to being at the top of the class students and this made them a little uncomfortable. Boy, I got, <laughs> I, I got through a little bit lucky, I guess. This is the, uh... So the next thing I wanna show you is just a video from a classroom. And one thing I do point out is whenever the press comes, they always say, oh, we heard this classroom is using computers in the classroom, we want footage of computers in the classroom. And what, what I would say, well, no, no, the whole point of this is to make the classroom as interactive as possible. And these classrooms are actually, most of the time, you're actually not seeing the computer. You're actually seeing, because the kids are doing so much on their own pace, you're seeing them doing manipulatives, you're seeing them doing projects, you're seeing them having conversations with each other. But, but the, you know, if the story is about computers in the classroom, that's what they want footage of. So that's what you're gonna see here, but, I think it does capture the energy level in these classrooms pretty well to show that it's not like this Vulcan or Borg reality of you know, just kids doing questions all day. From Mountain View, California, NBC's Kristen Welker has our story tonight. What makes fifth graders cheer? Would you believe math? Yes. I'm starting to really like math now. These kids are learning with the help of Khan Academy, an online school. You got it right. Good job. Videos that are interactive and fun, explaining difficult concepts in a conversational way. Oh, oh the mouse. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, so, so you know, out of that, there was actually a, a, a very funny story that came out. There, there was a, uh, the, the reporter saw a little fifth grader on, you know, in that classroom and she was doing, working on basic trigonometry, but she was really understanding it. She understood the ratios of the sides of a right triangle and things like that. R reporter was impressed, uh, sits down next to her and says, you know, do, do you think this is fifth grade math? And, and the girl got a very mischievous grin on her face and she goes, no, I think it's sixth grade. Which is, <laughs> she's, uh, she's in for a pleasant surprise, I think, or maybe. Uh... So, you know, anecdotally, the teachers were, were really excited about it. They felt that they were really engaged. They were spending time with students that they weren't able to spend before. You know, one thing we say was we, it was optimizing. It was opt whatever the student to teacher ratio was, what it was optimizing was the student to valuable time with the teacher ratio, or the student to valuable time with the teacher and his or her peers ratio. And, the, and, the, and everyone kind of, kind of felt that. But we still had to measure it, um, just to make sure at minimum that harm wasn't being done, uh, which is an important question to ask. Uh, the fifth grade classes, which is actually, it's a high performing school district, 96% at grade level or above, which actually isn't that amazing. The district average was 92%. What was amazing was what happened in the seventh grade classes, because these actually were, for lack of a better word, remedial math classes. And they, it was an affluent neighborhood, but these were the kids essentially from the other side of El Camino or the other side of the railroad tax, depending on, on how you want to view it. And we were actually worried about that. We're like, oh, maybe Khan Academy works for Navia, motivated students, the fifth graders, but what about this, this crowd that to some degree has been discounted? And it's kind of the same narrative as that other chart you saw. Entering into it, 23% were proficient, and they were the low end of proficient. That's why they were in this class. The rest of the distribution was well below that. I mean, you even have 6% well below basic. And I want to point out, this is not a rigorous study. It's not something, it's not a publishable study. It was a very small cohort. And there was, for the seventh graders, there wasn't even a control. But the signal ended up being strong enough, even in this small cohort, that they wanted to see more this year. And this year, we are running the, the, the larger, more rigorous studies. But what really convinced the district, the teacher, and, and surprised us was after six months, double the number of kids, so six plus 35, the 41% were now at grade level or above. And what really blew everyone's mind, so that, and, and the whole distribution moved in the right direction. So it wasn't just a separation that the, you know, the slightly better kids moved ahead and the slower kids slowed down. There were no longer any far below basic students. And the really amazing thing that they had never seen, and it, it, it was an unbelievable rock star teacher, so it was, you know, we, we, we skewed the results in our favor. I mean, she was on the astronaut training program and all of that, so it's hard to figure out how much was, was her impact, which I'm sure was significant. But she had never seen in that classroom that exiting it, that you actually now had some students that were advanced. Some students, and that's that 6% right there. Some students who had leapfrogged ahead of kids who were not diagnosed as remedial or learning disabilities or whatever else. So, so the last thing I, I want to share with you, you know, Khan Academy, what we're doing in schools, it's, it's exciting. It's really an experiment. We're learning. We're learning. I mean, the whole point of we're now working with 50 classrooms is try to learn as much from the students and teachers as we can. We're bringing teachers, researchers on staff to try to understand what the, where the content can go. But still, the bulk of our usage is, frankly, one-off people around the world who, who have nothing else. And this last video kind of exemplifies that, just how much potential there is out there, and if we just allow people to tap into it, what, what might happen. My name is Mark Halberstadt. Growing up, uh, I was really always a C student. I, I think I was really pretty much always pretty pitiful in school. I don't think I've ever gotten higher than a B plus in any math class ever, uh, particularly. I pretty much thought that the only thing I was good enough to do in college was major in music. I went off and I uh, got a music degree in saxophone. But I, I sort of almost felt that it was more I was getting it because I was terrible at everything else. Kind of worked as a saxophone player for a few years. Really what I wanted to do was uh, do electrical engineering. And the last thing that I remember completely not getting was trig identities. So I went to YouTube and I did a search for trig identities and the Khan Academy was the first thing that popped up. Watched a bunch of videos in the trig playlist to kind of get caught up to speed. I watched all the videos in the calculus playlist. I watched all the videos in the physics playlist. Watched a bunch of videos on dividing decimals and even uh, on a subtraction by borrowing. I watched a, a lot of videos on, on arithmetic. That was in 2007. I did that uh, until the fall of 2010. And in the fall 2010, I, uh, I took a leap and I decided to go, uh, go back to school and went to uh, Temple University, majored in electrical engineering, getting a second bachelor's. And keep in mind, I, I don't think I've ever gotten above a B plus in math classes. And I was really a straight C student growing up. And I just finished this year, first year back in college, I got a 4.0 GPA for the entire year. I got 
perfect scores on both of my calc final exams and also on my chemistry final exam. I ended uh, calculus, chemistry, both calculus classes, Calc 1 and 2, and chemistry with an average higher than 100%. I, there are some Khan Academy videos that I probably listen to the same concept over 20 or 30 times. And there is no tutor in the world I could have paid to have sat next to me and repeated the same thing over 20 or 30 times without at least them getting a little bit judgmental, or at least them getting, thinking like, oh, well, this guy really is never going to get this concept and he should just give up. Where the understanding really happened was watching those videos and, and also working through the Khan Academy software and everything. The impact for me in my life, I, I really see it growing exponentially over the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Oh, it's a... Uh... No, I mean, that's powerful. I mean, whenever, whenever we have a, a, job, a recruiting candidate who's kind of on the fence between us and Google and Facebook, I just play that video. And I was like, <laughs> how do those stock options look now? And, but, you know, we could talk more in depth in the other session. I'd, I'd love to take as many questions as possible in that session. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of an exciting time to be in, I think, for all of us. And, and what we see, we definitely are at this inflection point in history with what's going on in the world, information and all the rest. And, and we think new inflection points need new institutions, things that can reach the world, especially there's kids, millions, actually billions of kids who have nothing. And so we're hoping that we can be that type of institution that steps into that while also being a tool for you guys to really supercharge what you do. And, and we look forward to working with you all to, to make, make the best possible tool. Thank you.